Claire, what was it about Rassan and his music that inspired you to do this recording? Um, I love so much about Rassan. I love his, the freedom in his playing. I love his unstoppable quality. I mean, if you know about him, he, he was blind um, and traveled all over the world. Like, I mean, he was completely a musician. He, I mean, he just was so in himself all the time that I just really respect everything about it. Um, I love his sense of humor comes through. Um, his politics come through his, um, his humanity is just great to me. I, he's just one of my favorite artists. I mean, you know, and again, a lot of times, you know, different people bring different things into the game. And, uh, and so I think a, a million people, I think are amazing artists and I love them. And, but just certain ones speak to us at some level it's just a matter of um preference you know personal preference because there are so many amazing musicians in so many um, ways that uh he's just one he reached me the second the the i wore out the return of the five thousand pound man actually uh, when i discovered him and um oh by the way in that clip that you just showed i think it was ron burton on piano yeah, ron burton on piano I didn't know the other guys. I think that's in Europe. I think that's probably the, or, a, a or, European. Or, 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 haba, haba. Europe in the early 60s. Or Ron Burton yeah. was his longtime pianist, though. The other guys, I think it was a pickup band. Yes. Claire, how did you get started? But, wait, on I your... want to say, Brett, I want to tell you that I think that that stretch that he's playing, the straightened alto, um, is the one that I'm playing in that picture that you had up at the beginning. That picture that you had up at the beginning is at the cap. There, um, there, the, Steve Borkenhagen and his family own this cl club that's dedicated, you know, they love Rasan, And so they called it the cafe street and Dorothon g gave them, um, I think, I don't know if it's his only stretch or one of them, but, um, but I actually got to play his stretch. So, uh, I'm a real geek. <laughs> when I'm a fan, I am really a fan. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a privilege to be able to play his horn. Claire, I wanted to ask you, your journey into this music and into the baritone sax, when did it begin? How did you get into the baritone and why did you choose the baritone? Oh, okay. Um, my journey into the music had been when I was 12 and I played alto and played alto when I went to Berkeley. And for, for, for a pretty long time, I think in 85, I moved back to New York City and somebody had a baritone for sale and I went to try it and it turns out, well, I played one note on it and it, the, it was epiphany day, you know, it was, it was a big deal and I knew that that was my voice and I was like, here I am. And it turns out that it was the horn that Howard Johnson's mother bought him in 1956 or seven. And um, yeah, so Howard is actually also on the return of the 5,000 pound man playing some tuba. But, um, but it turned out to be Howard's first horn. And then it turned out that Howard was my neighbor in Manhattan, in Chelsea, and uh, we became very good friends. So it's a, it's a one horse world, isn't it? <laughs> well, you were lucky to uh, be part of the scene. When did you actually get into the city and start participating in this music? Um, I, I grew up in New York, so I, st I spent my, in my youth, I came in a lot and heard jazz concerts. My father was very supportive of my interest in jazz and brought me to a lot of concerts when I was young, which was cool. And then I went to Boston, I went to Berkeley and came back to, New York in 85 as a player and have been making a living playing basically since then. Wow. Who were some of the baritone players that had some influence on you? 
Oh, it's always so hard to answer these kind of questions for me. I, I mean, I'd have to say Serge Shaloff is um, a, a, one of my favorites um, for many reasons. Um, but I, uh, they, they've all had influence. I mean, I loved, I loved, I, th- I saw Jerry Mulligan when I was young, although I wasn't a baritone player then, so I didn't connect, I didn't connect to him th- that way or I didn't connect myself to him that way. Um, but I would say Jerry Mulligan, Serge Shaloff. Um, I love Joe Temperley's lines. I love Serge's sound. Um, oh, I wish I'd made a list cause I, I'm going to leave out 10 people who I know and adore. I think that Ronnie Cuber is, you know, just a transcendent musician. Um, beyond just the baritone, I think he's just a great, such a great musician that it, it he's he's always um, when when he plays funk, it sounds like funk, and when he plays Latin jazz, it's Latin jazz, and when he, whatever he's playing is it's so authentic, um, it's it's amazing. Well, uh, you didn't yeah. name someone but i'm going to play his clip here and we'll talk about him after Of course, that's the great Pepper Adams. Ever see Pepper Clark live Perry. or talk to him? I never did, and I never met him. Sad, sad. I, I, it would have been, I guess, early on in, in my life, but I wish. I mean, there another one, uh, one of the all-time greats, and no denying that. Yeah, he certainly knew his way around the horn. That's for sure. So I understand that you are in Manhattan, you are on Sixth Avenue, I believe. Do you have a view of the city out your window? I do, but I'm on. I'm only on the fourth floor. I don't have a high view, but um, yeah, I'm looking out at Sixth Avenue. And you've been sequestered for a number of weeks now. <laughs> what are your observations looking out that window? What do you see? Oh man, well, I've. I'll tell quickly the story. Um, I was in California. I was supposed to be there till April 8th, 
March 17th, it became obvious that I better get my ass home. And I took a, a red eye and got home about six in the morning. The, the grocery store downstairs, I live over a big grocery store. So the store opened at eight. I thought, well, I should go to the store. And uh, basically, that's what I've been doing for two and a half months. <laughs> been, you know, in my little studio apartment, which is lovely. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful, you know, for sure. But uh, um, I've been in here going to the grocery store and doing a few things. I mean, I, I, I go out occasionally in careful ways. But, uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing. And, and when I look out at 6th Avenue, I can say that um, it's been rough. Um, it's, it's been kind of a horrible depiction of the haves and the have-nots. And... Um, it it has evened out a little bit and people seem to have been taken places that needed to get shelter. But it was rough for the first month. Uh, very hard to see um, the streets of New York empty and desolate and, and with a high degree of desperation uh, from people. You know, in times like this, we learn more about ourselves because we're challenged in, in new ways. I'm wondering, where do you get the strength to draw upon to survive, given the fact that the future is a total unknown? <laughs> well, I'm a New Yorker, Brett. So I've been through a couple of uh, crises. And um, I, where do I get the strength? That's hard for me to say where it comes from, but I know that I'm going to be okay until I'm not. And in which case I think I'll know then that I'm not okay. But, um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm dedicated to learning and doing the best I can in my life. So this took me out for a few weeks. I was, I was really low energy for a while. And, um, fortunately I had been really getting healthy for a while you know, I'm working on getting myself healthier as a human. And um, so I came back with kind of a good foundation. So I haven't been, I've been very moderate. I'm not eating badly or doing anything stupid here. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm seeing it through. So I don't know, you get the strength, I guess, in the proverbial day at a time. Yeah. There, there are highs and lows that comes with it. That doesn't seem weird to me. And um, I have, uh, I think I have the patience to get to the next place. I was very concerned for a while. I de definitely questioned the validity of what I do. I mean, talk about non-essential. I never thought of myself as quite so non-essential as a jazz musician until, uh, until, until this. Um, but it's essential for me and I know it is. And I, I'll say, um, one of the great things that happened um, the other day was Concerts from Cars, who is this fantastic group here, mostly Brooklyn, I think, musicians, and I know most of them. Um, Ross Moshe called and said, um, Concerts from Cars is coming to 20th Street um, at 7 o'clock, such and such a day. So we met them there. They pull up in their cars. They have their instruments. Um, they get out. and and they play a 15 minute or so concert wherever they are and uh and then they drive off to the next location wow. so i was able to play live music with other musicians for the first time in two and a half months and it was extremely exciting and invigorating and uplifting because i you know it's it's it, we're all we're going to be doing that again we're going to be playing we're going to find a way to play music however we do. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. <clears throat> Pardon me. I think music is essential. I couldn't go through a day without listening to jazz. I mean, me you too. Know, <laughs> me too. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's very much part of my life and I need it. So I, what do you think of this whole live streaming thing that's been happening with people putting, with people playing music from their apartments and their houses? Um, it serves a purpose. I don't love it because 
I'm an I'm old school, and so going out to hear music is a, is a very important part of my musical existence. Um, I like to be in a room with people who are playing music, or be in a room playing music for people that are there for that. And it, it's it's great that it can happen online. Um, it's not as great for me. I look forward to getting back out and hearing people live. Yeah, th th there's nothing that can replace live music. Certainly. I know, live music. It's its its own thing, for yeah. sure. It's essential. Question for one of our viewers. Uh, uh -oh. Do you sing? And I'll add to that. Do you play any other <laughs> instruments besides the baritone sax? I do. I do all that stuff. Um, I do sing on gigs, you know, for years, I, I never wanted to be identified as a singer because I'm a saxophone player. And I had some thing about that, but um, I, I sang on gigs a lot, but you had to come to the gig to find that out. I was never gonna put it out there that I was singing. Um, I, sing, I think I sang a song on every record I made or on most of them. Um, so uh, I sneak it in there and I like doing it just for the sake of it. I'm not a singer and I don't want to be um, critiqued as a singer. I just do. I just like to do it. I like to I put it in there when the spirit moves me. Um, and it's fun. I'm liking it more. Maybe I'll do more of it. Um, so, yes, I, I sing. I, I started on alto saxophone. I played alto tenor and soprano uh, for a living for some years before I moved back to New York and started and, and got that baritone that changed my life. <laughs> yeah. Now you, you, we were talking before about inner strength. Uh, when I think of the baritone sax, I think of a heavy instrument that requires a lot of air. Am I correct in that assumption? You are correct, sir. Yes. That's, a, that's the thing about the baritone. It, uh, it picks you if you're a baritone player. Um, uh, I don't even know what to say about that. It never occurred to me. I never really cared about the weight of it or all that um, until later years where I'm like, wow, this thing is, you know, and some people, I remember Don Payne, a baritone player saying to me, um, you know, some point, at some point you won't be able to get around with it. And I thought, wow, that's scary. So I better play it as much as I can until then. Well, I want to cut to a, uh, a live session that uh, Claire did uh, that also features the great Ernie Watts. So let's check out some of Claire Daly on baritone. Please say hello to Claire Daly. Thank you very much. I'm extremely excited to be here. This is my first time at this conference and uh, you are uh, quite a wonderful group of people. Um, I live in New York City, um, I play the baritone sax, and um, I brought a tune for us to play that's on a new CD that I've made of jazz versions of Motown tunes from the Detroit years. So, uh, this one is, uh, is an old Temptations tune, and this is our take on uh, cloud nine.
very tasty <laughs> arrangements of cloud nine what a fun memory thank you for for playing that no yeah. i think i recognize of course ernie watts and the trumpeter was brad good and i think terry lynn carrington on drums no that is helen oh dear i'm gonna have to i have to i don't know helen's last name i don't can't remember it right now she's from south america and she's a spectacular i think she studied with terry lynn actually she okay. may have gone to berkeley and been with terry lynn up there but um adrian ferrugia from toronto on piano uh roni barak on on the turkish drums there i don't know I, I, I'm, I'm i'm forgetting what that thing is called um who else and uh Barbeau, it, oh, his first name. Ah, I'm so sorry. I can't remember everybody's names right off the bat. That's a problem these days. Well, um, I'll, I'll put it in the in the comments. What was that great. gig? Well, that was a great gig. That gig was called the Conference on World Affairs in Boulder, Colorado, and Brad Good called me and invited me to play. And so it's this conference on world affairs and it happens um, at the University of Colorado there. And it's a week long conference. There's a jazz concert on Tuesday night and Brad was uh, putting together, the. I, I did it twice and um, some of the most fun gigs. So we're all there he he brought in a very international band. He he always he's so thoughtful. Brad Good is the top of the heap of musician and and humanity. Um, so he had this great band, and uh, we played a concert. But they used everybody there. They put the musicians on the panels during the week too. So the way I describe it is if, if the panel is on global warming, there are going to be two or three experts on global warming, an astronaut, 
a musician and a teacher, you know, just a, a wide variety of people on the panels so that it keeps it kind of engaged with everybody there. So it doesn't turn into just talking about things nobody knows anything about. And it, it, it's a brilliant conference. And um, oh, it's the, those are some of my favorite gigs that I've done. Those people right there, every one of them is, is just a stellar human being. And since then, I've been up to Toronto to play with uh, with Adrian and his wife, Sophia, who's a singer. And, you know, it's the the branching out from that gig is uh, has been remarkable in my life. I've met some people that are really the most important players in my life from that gig. Really? Now, you got a Rasan a tribute recording coming out. That was a yes. Motown thing you did. Could you talk to us about the, your Motown recording? Okay. Um, another uh, label that, well, I had done a recording for Doug Moody at uh, North Coast Brewing Company to promote their brother Thelonious Ale. And after that, a few years later, Doug asked me if I would be interested in doing a Motown record, which I was completely interested in because I grew up on Motown music. Uh, so uh, so that was on his um, short-lived but lovely label. Um, bah, can't think of the label name now. But anyway, he, he put out a couple records after after that. And, um, and so that was all Motown tunes. Yeah. yeah. Got another question from uh, one of our viewers, Denny. Uh, who says that he's seen a recent video called Colonel Panic by Fearless Flyers that features Grace Kelly playing the baritone sax with a funk section. Do you know Grace? I have met Grace, yes. Yeah, she is a, a wonderful musician. She is. Absolutely. And she's cool. I haven't seen that, but I, I, I saw something where she had a baritone tone and I, I knew she was playing baritone and she plays quite a bit with Leo P that that uh, the, the two of them could jump around the, the two of them are uh, have uh, serious youthful energy on the big horn and um, and they they are using that so that's it's lovely another viewer open song wants to ask you what you think of the baritone sax player John Sermon Oh my God! See, this is why you can't. I can never answer a list of who I love. John Sermon blew my head open. I mean, I I had already loved his playing, um, but uh, there's a fly in my room. I'm sorry. Um, I had loved his playing, and then he was coming to Birdland, and I went with Tim Price to Birdland to hear him play, and my he just blew my head wide open. It was one of the greatest. It was just one of the greatest. It was amazing. So the answer, the short answer is I love him. And the longer answer is that show because I stayed for both sets. I, and I moved down from wherever I was sitting. I sat in the front row for the second set and just soaked him up. I'm, I'm, I'm a devoted fan there too. Yeah, I am really a geek. If I come to your gig and I'm having a good time, I'm going to, I'm going to stay for the whole thing. And, and, you know, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a fan. Yeah. Now, Claire, you've been around the scene for, for a couple of decades now, played with different people, recorded yeah, in a plot, number of different right. settings. What haven't you done that you want to do in this music? Um, oh, what a great question. I never get asked that. Um. I just want to keep playing and getting better and playing with great players. Um, I think, I think on the, I'm going to make another record, I think this year. Uh, and I feel like I want to include more of the other things I do, such as I didn't mention that I like to play flute really a lot. That's one of the doubles that I like. Um, and I think I'll, I think I'm going to do a record where I play at least baritone and flute and sing. And if I'm really ambitious, I might put alto in it because I started on alto and I, I do still love when I pick it up. I, I usually am happy I'm playing it. Yeah. 
Um, I also love, I, I still would love to be in a great funk band. I love playing funk. Um, I, I love playing free jazz. See, that's just a weird thing. I know that I'm hard to categorize because I, I, I love playing free jazz too. So, you know, I've been doing more of that as I've, as I've gotten older in life. Um, cause it's, it's a really fun way to express oneself. So, you know, more of that too. Absolutely. A viewer, Wyatt Thury wants to know, what is your practice schedule and what do you recommend for people <laughs> learning the baritone? Okay, great question. Bad time to ask it because really during this pandemic, two and a half months, my practice schedule has been um, less than uh, something to brag about. Um, uh, what I would recommend to anybody starting is to get a good foundation. Get lessons with somebody who can really show you how to play the horn correctly. Because um, if you have, if you try, if you're self teaching and you have some bad habits, they will limit you at some point. They limit you down the line. And I'm a big proponent of just get the right instruction early on on how to play the instrument. That's what I got from, I feel that that's what I got from Joe Viola when I, when I studied with him. And I think that's really important. My own practicing uh, in theory, because I swear my practicing has been, I don't even know what to say, spotty <laughs> through, throughout uh, this pandemic um, for various reasons. And it's okay. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's okay. Um, but I, one of my basic things, and I think that Lenny Pickett said this, or I think that's who I originally heard it from, to split your practice time in thirds. So if you have an hour, you'd spend 20 minutes on sound and tone production, sound, overtones, long tones, just making sound, really developing a sound and an embouchure. Uh, one third of your time on technique, and one third of your time playing music, whatever that means, um, working on tunes, playing free, experimenting, etudes, soloing, whatever, you know, whatever, however you interpret just music, transcribing, very important. Um, so that's a basic thing that, that I teach first. I also do teach, and I'm gonna be teaching on Zoom and Skype and FaceTime. <laughs> So get in touch. Well, how can people get in touch with you if they're interested in studying? You know, I'm going to be um, putting up some kind of an ad soon, um, but basically just get in touch with me. So they can um, email me at, do I say it? Yes, you can say it. cdbjazz at aol.com. I know I'm the last person left on AOL. Um, you can contact me on um, Instagram. You can contact me on, I'm on Facebook. Um, what else is there? Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I don't see the Twitter uh, messages that often, but the best way is probably Instagram or email. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a social media world and I hope uh, some of our viewers are interested in studying Claire will reach out to her. I know that uh, Jimmy Heath once told me that teaching is learning. What do you get from teaching? Usually that. Um, when you have to explain something to someone else, it just becomes more clear to you every time. Um, I also get, which I, one of the things I love about teaching is when that moment when you see the light go on for somebody about, it could be just some little thing. And it's just, all you have to do is if I, if as a teacher, I just have the patience to find where they are and see if I can get them one more thing that makes a light come on. It's, that's a beautiful moment. 
Yes. And I also see myself in students when I see them get excited about something or I see them, again, that light go on. Um, it's, I don't know. It's kind of like you relive it yourself when you see it happen for somebody else. Yeah, teaching is, is, is a very special thing. I've done some teaching yeah. and that light bulb moment is fantastic. I mean, <laughs> it's a high, right? <laughs> when it all comes together. Claire, I can't thank you enough for, for stopping by and, and sharing some time with us. I know that uh, many people do not know your music. Hopefully they'll have heard something and seen something on here that will lead them to go to your website, go to iTunes, go to YouTube and learn more, more about Claire Daly, who's an amazingly talented baritone sax player and a wonderful person as well. So thanks so much, Claire. Brett, thank you so much. It's great to see you and thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it. We'll be back tomorrow with Lou Tobacco. So long, uh, everybody. Oh. Stay safe.